It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Jeff Leo Herman. I threw that in there in the introduction for you, who is the CRO of Fathom, a digital marketing agency that creates data-driven, profitable growth. And uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi, Andy. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So take a minute, introduce yourself. I mean, how'd you get your start in sales? I got my start in sales uh, many moons ago in actually local broadcast radio back in the day. 22-year-old graduate of the Ohio State uh, the, University. Oh my gosh, not one of those I, people, not I the Ohio to, State University. I have to add it, the <laughs> Ohio State. Is it possible to go there and not say it that way? You have to. It's, well, it's, so, it's the, so here's the question. Is there another Ohio State University? I don't believe there is. There are state universities in Ohio. Okay, well, I was just wondering where the this whole... And I'm going, to be, I'm going to be kind and call it an affectation of, of adding the V before Ohio State University. How'd that get started? I, you know what? I don't know. It's a great question. But um, it's a branding maneuver that's stuck. It's really <laughs> stuck. I the, thought it was just an annoying maneuver. But anyway, okay, we can do call it a branding hey, maneuver. So you're not, I'm in the Buckeye State, so I'm cool <laughs> with it, right? That's my undergrad. So, yeah, and it's funny. I, to get back to the background... I, you know, look, I'm in my mid-40s. I've had a long career in sales and marketing both. I started driving around Columbus, Ohio with the Yellow Pages. Yeah. Selling local AM radio. 22 years old, sold Rush Limbaugh for WCOL AM. Um, You know, at that time, I was a fairly liberal guy, early 90s, selling for Rush, you know, selling spots for Rush Limbaugh. In that my coworkers can't stand when I say... When I was your age, I was driving around Columbus, Ohio with the yellow pages. So, but, uh, you know, that, that, I tell you, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. Because oh, no. I had hustling. the same. So I had similar, similar hustling start in my I career mean, as well. Swinging doors. My first sale was to a Civil War bookshop. And literally, you walk in, and I learned so much. And, I, and it was fun to see the seasoned sales guys really say, hey, lose the coat, loosen the tie, don't carry the briefcase in, kind of stroll into a store like you're curious, don't walk in like you're there to sell to them. So it's interesting, um, that advice I got back in the early 90s, I've stuck with. And that's the way I approach business today. It's really about helping, teaching, solving problems, engaging in very relevant ways and understanding, you know, Understanding what the current pain points are and then to the extent that I can solve them or help solve them by introducing them to someone else. That's And I skipped a lot in between with the Nielsen company and lots of great experience there. But uh, that's that's the, the very root story. So was Rush an easy sale or a hard sale? Uh, it was easy if I tar- did my targeting right. And mm-hmm. once again, it's, it's all targeting. So, <laughs> you know, it's uh, I happened upon, you know, several con- I targeted conservative businesses or what I would assume would be conservative individuals with conservative client bases. So, it, it once again, it's all about targeting. I mean, that's why in sales there's been so much talk about – I talk a lot about getting away from volumetric prospecting models or spray and pray – into really hyper-targeted programs in which there's so much more engagement, your conversion rates are higher, your sales cycles faster, and your and your close rates increase dramatically. We, you know, so I, I'm an advocate. We had an inside sales organization at one point where there were volumetric t- guys and there were um, more plotting and methodical team members, and those team members won and delivered more results over the long term. Well, that, okay, that's an interesting topic. We'll we'll start there. That's uh, there has been, there is mm-hmm. um, debate within you know the sales community about this concept, and I'm actually trying to <laughs> further this debate because I've just my own my own perspective on the way things need to be is quality versus quantity, and yes. so certainly with the growth of the inside sales model, especially in you know certain tech sectors. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lip service is given to quality, I think, but at the end mm-hmm. of the day, as you said, it's still the volumetric uh, approach is still winning the day out. And some of that you can 
gosh, we can talk about the reasons for that, whether it's, you know, investor pressure to meet certain targets, uh, which, you know, bleeds down to the sales leaders and so on. But Salesforce dashboards, Salesforce <laughs> dashboards, you know, whatever tool they have, you know, the automation of the sales technology. Right. Right. But that actually seems to be carrying the day, at least in the, the tech sector. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me like it's, it's ultimately going to be self-defeating. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we are, I'm a major advocate of social selling and, you know, just doing that. Look, the inbox, it's, it's so crowded and it's, and emails are so easy to ignore. And I have a great example, a great story. Yesterday I got, I'm, I'm attending a Marketo summit here in a couple of weeks, getting all of the preliminary emails. Hey, come see us at booth XYZ. And, uh, I got a, I ne- I literally delete. Well, first of all, I all the pro- cold prospecting emails I get, I save in a separate folder, mm-hmm. share them with my team every week, and basically they're all examples of don't do this, don't do that. That this this I, why I, is why is this not working? Why is that not working? I do the same thing. Yeah, and 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 any any cold prospecting email that that has a lot of I and me and we, you know, I want to this and that, my company X Y Z. There's no value in it whatsoever for me, the recipient. So emails are easy to ignore. Uh, the delete key, I'm a massive um, deleter of emails or, in effect, moving them out of my inbox into this, into this shared folder. The and, folder of shame. Yes. And, and so yesterday I got a great email from a guy at Curata who um, knew I'm going to – you know, he said, look, unfortunately I'm not at the – going to the Marketo conference because I have to watch my dog, but uh, who will be attending the Barketo <laughs> conference link here to my LinkedIn profile to see a picture of my dog. <laughs> and I just thought, so here's something I work with all the time. How do you not be another easily to ignore superficial name in the inbox? How do you drive people to your LinkedIn profile where you can illustrate not only your knowledge and expertise, but something unique about you, something that doesn't make you another superficial salesperson pushing product, but a real value-adding, helpful individual that has a family and has experience and has something interesting about them. So I'm always working on ways to get that LinkedIn profile or whatever profile you choose, right? Get that in front of your prospects to see if there's a way uh, to engage with them while simultaneously, of course, you're observing their profile. So mm-hmm. this guy did a really effective method of getting me to click on his LinkedIn profile, and I saw him as a person with a goal in mind to get me to, to sign, send, sign up for a meeting, and, and I felt a degree of empathy with him. Because and, of his dog? Yeah, just his approach. <laughs> I, and, and as a student, of, I literally said, hey – you're the only email I've responded to in six months. Right. Uh, as an aficionado, a student of, of sales prospecting, I, you know, you got me. Good for you. I connected with him on LinkedIn. I, I set an appointment. You know, good, the good news is, too, is the company has actually, there's value. I'm curious about what, what the company does. So um, that's, I wouldn't have set the appointment if, if I wasn't interested in, in actually the product he was representing. But uh to the extent he broke through because he made it very personal, made it a little quirky, showed you know his personality, and, and I no longer saw him as this easy to ignore, superficial name in the inbox. Yeah, I thought extremely clever. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that, and that sort of falls into um, I don't know if you've read Stu Hynek's book about con- contact marketing. <laughs> you know, it's how to get a meeting with anyone. Right, you know that sort of falls in that category. You know, what, how, what do you do? That's that's it's okay to be clever, right? In order to grab somebody's attention. I mean, you don't want to dismiss things that you might think are gimmicky. I mean, if they're sincere and authentic, as, as this clearly was, uh, it can still be funny and clever and catch your attention. And that's fine. Right. Well, and you know, the word of the day, the word of the year, the word of our era is authenticity, and we have all of these great social media tools at our disposal. You know, be it if you're a video publisher, if you actively, you know, kind of dialogue via social media platforms, what have you. If you're authentic, you will win. If you're a real person expressing your opinion and really putting yourself out there to help and solve problems, you will win. And anyone that's posi- – I, I see, you know, once again as a student of prospecting, I see people pumping video and, and really um, using that to, to drive engagement – 
and you can it's so superficial you can tell that that you're just another name and uh, on their list of people to uh to tackle mm-hmm. and and that that authenticity has to ring through and and that's that's truly the way that that we are winning and and really just be yourself be authentic and that um you know guaranteed win rates and 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 even it's sustainability so right. you might not get the pop but from a sustainability standpoint i'm still doing business with people i've done in a different industry effectively right sure from the nielsen company worked with massive brands and massive media companies doing ad effectiveness work and measuring the efficacy of online video versus mobile media and now I'm working at a digital marketing agency with with mid and enterprise clients, but really more about how to break through and you know help help them connect with their prospects and customers, effectively communicate, and then eventually celebrate with them. Right, right. Well, let's let's jump jump into a thing I issue I'd raised before, which is uh, this idea of of how content marketing can rock sales and. There was, I think you in our pre pre interview talk. Uh, I think you sort of made reference to this. Is, is even the term content marketing sort of came under attack in the mm-hmm. Twitter sphere a couple weeks ago? Right. What was that all about? I mean, and why does it matter? Well, it matters. Content marketing, and I'm a you know everything I say, I'm I'm a, taking it from the school of Joe Polizzi and the Content Marketing Institute. Who I have utmost respect for. I love that organization. I love those people and I love their mission. And a great book. If, if no one's read Content Inc., they should be. That's they it. should put it on the top of their list. Yeah. Content Inc., that's a great for entrepreneurs and, and sales professionals. That's a great book. And then, and then Joe's previous book, Epic Content Marketing, is really more for enterprise marketers. Mm-hmm. But it gives a great perspective on kind of the role of content marketing. So, so how's content marketing different than marketing? Well, content marketing is specifically, it's leading with valuable, educational, relevant content that will solve a problem towards a business goal. And it's not, it's not as, as you know, Joe says, it's as old as the hills. It's, it's hundreds of years old. I think certain people have um, think, thinks that the term has been misused or misaligned. I mean, marketing is, you know, I learned in business school, you know, three Ps, four Ps, three Cs, I'm sorry. But content marketing is really just leading with it being an educational resource. And look, if you're, if bottom line, I don't care if it's marketing, sales, or just being a human being, if you're out to help somebody and you're help, out to help them solve problems and you're out to kind of engage with them in a relevant way, you will win. And content marketing is a critical pursuit because I'll go back to, you know, Google destroyed, destroyed the sales profession, right? So a lot of salespeople are mad about content marketing because I believe, you know, Google dis- destroyed the sales profession because uh, the eight days of asymmetrical information are gone. So salespeople used to hold all the cards. Exactly. Now consumers are empowered. Consumers can find out what they want when they want it. I have another, I'm sure you know Marcus Sheridan. Mm -hmm. He's he's a great guy. He's another guy that I've gotten to know. We share the same belief. I learned this from him as well. That to the extent that Google is the place consumers go to find answers to questions. And and they've trained consumers. If not, we're all spoiled by instant gratification. We become very fickle. And so the role of sales has evolved in a world of content marketing, in a world where brands are putting out all the valuable information mapped to the buyer's journey, the best thing a salesperson can do is become a curator and a teacher and filter out and filter out that noise and really try to be a, a helpful resource. So, well, I, definitely, uh, it definitely puts more of an emphasis on being a service profession. Right. I mean, uh, yeah. Given you know, how do you differentiate yourself in a sales perspective from everybody else that's out there if all this information is equally available? And quite frankly, when you have all that information out there, is in the mind's eye of the buyers, all the vendors pretty much start looking alike. Right. So, right. yeah, how you differentiate yourself really is, as I talk about in my, my writings, my books, it's, it's less about what you're selling and more about how you sell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's that, uh, I hate to say it, the no like trust, right? I mean, we, I feel like. Well, we, you shouldn't hate to say it. It's, it's still very yeah. relevant, if yeah. not more so. Right. It, it's, I feel like the same. 
things are bandied about because I didn't even use my favorite stat, which is the stat that's built this whole social selling industry, which is 57% of the buyer's journey is complete before they, you know, engage with sales. But well, uh, well let's hold that thought because I want to I talk about that when we come back because obviously there's, there's a lot of disagreement about that in the sales community. So mm -hmm. uh, with my guest, Jeff Herman, we're going to come back and talk more about content marketing, how it drives sales and what it can do for you. And we'll be right back. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on demand service which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales rep's calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. Okay, back with my guest, Jeff Herman from Fathom Digital Marketing Agency. We've been talking about content marketing, and uh, we talked about this now <laughs> infamous or famous stat, 57% of the, you know, the buyers, 57% of the way through their buying journey before they interact with sales for the first time. And I don't know, a year ago at Serious Decisions annual conference, you know, they presented a research to supposedly refuted that whole thing, which I think you know, they got a standing ovation in their audience when they did that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's there's you know, segments of people who believe that's just not true. And so I personally believe it's true. <laughs> I I I was the centerpiece of before that stat even came out, if you've spent any time in sales, you knew that's what was happening already. Right. And I wrote about it in my first book. I said long before that stat ever materialized. What? Why are people so put off by that? I, it, it's a control issue, and, and because in sales we're very, um, I would I should say the personality alignment of sales professionals tends to be very um, bullish, very proud, if not egotistical. Um, you know, salespeople have always carried the burden. And that's where this is kind of gets into the sales and marketing alignment mm -hmm. arguments uh, to the extent that marketing is really in the driver's seat, right? So assuming, and I also believe, violently believe that the buyer's journey is, is lots of information is collected. I'm not, I don't care how far down the buyer's journey they've gone. There's Lots of information pre and during a sales process that the buyer can get to kind of um, confirm or refute things they're thinking. So to the extent that um, the, the sales professionals who aren't um, embracing their modern marketing team and all the data that are available, the signals available from buyers, if you have say, an instance of a marketing automation platform uh, and that those nurture paths are laid out with great content, great compelling content assets, the data you can learn, I, I stage base all my content. So I can literally see, and even in this, so there's a marketing perspective here where the marketing team is driving engagement. They're, they're operating from an always-on standpoint. They can always communicate and anticipate the next move and really help to support the buyer down their journey. But even from a prospecting model, the role of content is critical because you can, even if you're prospecting, you can have two content assets. One is upper funnel, one's lower funnel, and literally see which one they click on and get the, you know, make that stage determination capture those signals. So the sales professionals that aren't leveraging and leaning into that data to listen and learn are really going to lose out. And, and there are, you know, in one respect, you can lean in your marketing team, and in another respect, we can do it ourselves with, you know, sales communication platforms that are out there, the email platforms, right, that track clicks and opens. So sure. Well, I mean, this 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 <clears throat> argument by the, um, you know, let's say the f far one end of the spectrum proponents of of uh, outbound prospecting, which, you know, to me is is, you know, an ideal world. <laughs> you know, if an ideal world would exist, you would. You would be so aligned with marketing. Marketing would be so effective to generate all the leads you need, but mm -hmm. very few companies operate in an ideal world, and, and right. you got to do what you got to do. It's just outbound prospecting becomes part of that. But part of this, what I consider mythology about outbound prospecting that exists is, is as necessary as it is, is people 
sort of, I think, sort of self-delusion in some respects, saying that, oh, if I get a deal through an outbound prospecting, on average, those deals are bigger than deals I get through inbound leads. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. I mean, a customer is a customer, right? Whether they have a need or not, how they reach, how you engage with them, isn't going to dictate the size of the deal. Right. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, and I, I see no data. I, I analyze lots of data. We've, I've had deal volumes, deal size, significant contract value coming from inbound leads, uh, as well as prospecting. And I, and I think this notion of, you know, from a prospecting standpoint, you have to figure the, the kind of the sampling base. So those that you prospect, say the whales that you prospect over a period of time, you know that they have the opportunity to give you larger deal sizes. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course, the deal sizes, they might think they're larger, but I think they're not doing the proper calculation or they don't have the proper denominator because of course they're going to attract the bigger deals and the bigger companies. Um, that's why they prospect those companies. So exactly. You know, and the second part of that, that same thing, which again, I think for people listening is, is not to kid themselves, is that there's a higher close rate with deals that are developed through outbound prospecting than through inbound. And uh, again, my experience over decades <laughs> of dealing with mm -hmm. this is that once you have a well-qualified prospect, mm -hmm. that doesn't matter where they originate, the close rate should be the same. Right. And yeah, if it's I, not, if it's not, it's it's your fault as a seller. It's not the prospect. Exactly. Exactly. It, all the data I have states that inbound leads close faster it, it, because of that degree of education, both self education and once again the sales professional plays a role. Uh, once again, from accessing the content library that's been put forward. So you know, I'm circling back to our original question. Such a huge advocate of content marketing because it's it's really focusing on the buyer's journey in the very early stages of status quo and problem recognition, and you have a sep a completely separate set of content that's very industry driven, insights driven, kind of what if scenarios versus you know later down the stages when you're into consider compare. Yeah, sure, you want to see compare graphs and price pricing specs and things of that nature. So. Well, I think I, that I, my, my belief is that in an inbound environment like that is is that the motivation for a prospect to engage with sales is that they've got needs for information that just can't be answered through the content marketing. Right. I mean, you get there's only a level, a certain level of detail you can get to. Right. And beyond that, you got to engage with the salesperson. But right. at that point, the prospect you talked about, the prospect. <laughs> has a degree of urgency because they've invested time and effort into their buying journey already, mm -hmm. is that when they finally do engage with sales, by definition, there's a degree of urgency there because they've got fewer questions that need to be answered. They see the light at the end of the tunnel, and they want to get that job done. Right, right, precisely. Yeah. I mean, okay, great. We're in violent agreement. So um, one question that sort of comes up is you talk about content marketing. And this is, again, a question that you hear oftentimes from, from the audience, and you see it in reports, is that, Oh gosh, I saw a stat. I think that sales reps spend forty percent plus of their time searching for or or modifying content for sales purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how does a how does a company prevent that from happening? That's a great question. I mean, so of course there are technology responses to that, which I don't I won't get into. I'm not, I've been pitched on plenty of occasions. Yeah, let's let's that's it's dynamic, a to me it's yeah. a process issue. I mean it's an yeah. alignment issue. So how do you how do you build your process so that your reps aren't feeling like they're forced to go search for content or having found it, think that just doesn't fit their needs, they need to modify it. Right, right. So uh, part of that, so the burden is on the marketing team there. And just from an organizational standpoint and a process standpoint, if you have if this really dials back to do we have a strong sense of our ideal client profile? And do we have a strong sense of their goals? And to the extent that you put forward great content mapped, you know, written really very specifically and explicitly written for the ideal client profile and mapped against the buyer's journey and the various assets mapped against the buyer's journey, that that's source content can be used. But what's more important is the opinion of or the application of that content that comes truly from 
the perspective of the sales professional. So if you're a talented sales professional, you have an opinion on the application. You have an opinion on the situation. And the client, while they appreciate the big, massive white paper, they're, they're not going to read it. No. But they are going to listen to you. And I tell you know, clients and, and my team all the time, set, sure, send them the white paper. But if you do, in the first or second sentence, say, make sure you look at the stat on page seven. Exactly. It really made me think of you. Well, and let's get on a call tomorrow and talk about that point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's so that the customization, it's, it's, it's give a couple sentences of your opinion and you'll, you don't need to customize the white papers or the decks. That's a great point. That's a great point. So I several different points in there that are, that are really good for people in the audience listening is that one is, you know, I was stressed time and time again on the show with various guests is understand who your ideal client profile is. Mm-hmm. And having done that, unless you have just a completely brand new product you're selling that you've never sold before. If you have any experience with it, you should be able to understand what the buyer's journey is and what information they need at which stage of that process, at each stage of that process, in order to move forward to the next stage. Right. And so make that content available. And a great point Jeff just made is, yeah, maybe it's a white paper, but don't just send the white paper. It's like to me, that's like sending a proposal without right. reviewing it with the customer, right? I mean, that's, right. that's the worst thing a salesperson could do with a proposal is just, Whoa. yeah, I'm just sending it to you. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Here you go. Have fun with it. Uh, as opposed to, let's go on the phone. While we're on the phone, I'll send you the file. We'll go through it line by line. Mm-hmm. So same thing true with the, doc, the content you send is call out the key points that you want them to find that you think are relevant. Make sure you draw their attention to it. And then what I would further recommend is then use that excuse to engage with them the next time. Say, okay, let's talk about this tomorrow because this is really important to go through. Right, right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, good. Well, great. Great, great content. People want to learn more. We'll give, uh, give uh, your content information in just a, a few seconds so that people can go find out more about uh, what Fathom does relative to content marketing. In the meantime, we'll move to the last segment of the show. I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests. And the first one is a hypothetical scenario in which uh, you're, you play the leading role. And that you, Jeff, have just been hired in this scenario as a new sales leader at a company whose sales have stalled out. Mm-hmm. And the board and the CEO, they really want things to get turned around in a hurry. So your first week on the job, what two things could you do that would have the biggest impact? My first week on the job, what two things could, could you I do, do that could have the biggest impact? Uh, boy, I could think of 10, but the top two... I mean that 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 alone, like how do you approach a new engagement and how do you accelerate a stalled a stalled situation? Well, so first thing I would do is really look at um, I, I, I you know what I have to say. I'll go back to my roots in, in content marketing and my 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 belief in if we do we have an ideal client profile mm-hmm. and where where have we won? And to the extent that we have an ideal client profile that and and our mess in our mission statement is set forward in such a way that we have content assets that um, identify with the ideal client profile, I would certainly make sure that all of our messaging and communications are consistent and and almost to the extent where we're like a politician repeating our key message points so often um great sales professionals and I'm guilty of this love you know we think oh let's wing it you know let's go for it you know we feel like we're we can you know tap dance and in many cases we do but really nail down the sales process and especially around how are you identifying your opportunities and then how are you advancing those opportunities and how are you supporting that so, so, why is sales stalled? Well, is it is it are they not closing the deal? They have many great opportunities, but they're not closing. Are they not generating leads? So, really, there's just a ton of data I would dive into and probably spend, uh, you know, hours into the evening looking at the Salesforce instance, looking at win rates, looking at lead flow, really looking at um, where we've won and you know where we've lost, and trying to just better target. So. In a nutshell, targeting via data would be the first first approach. Mm-hmm. And then I would, um, you know, 
if they're looking to, you, we have choices, right? So you can you can grow existing accounts or go after new accounts. And to the extent that um, we all know there's less friction in growing existing accounts simply because there's already a relationship, there's already some affinity that's been built. I would really uh, double down on existing accounts and see what more we could offer or what, what ways there are to extend um, extend that relationship. Because to truly prospect in a way in the, in the way in which I believe, which is really knowing your ideal clients and being very careful about who you work with from a profitability standpoint over time, that takes too long to prospect your way into um, immediate growth. I, I look for leaning back into the current client base for the quick wins. All right. Good answer. Okay, so now I've got some rapid-fire questions for you. You can give me one-word answers or elaborate if you wish. So the first one is when you, Jeff, are out selling your services, what's your most powerful sales attribute? Passion. Who's your sales role model? Seth Godin. Okay. So... (laughs) One book. Every well, per- or maybe I could say Gary Vaynerchuk without the cursing. <laughs> <laughs> or with yeah, the I, cursing. He's, he's entertaining. It, it works for him, right? So his persona, gnarly, New Jersey, you know, really candid, good for him. I, I just have a different profile. Midwest, you know, grew up not uh, going to the Ohio State University Ohio for goodness State sakes University. right right even though I've you know I've sold it in New York lived in New York and lived in Chicago and lived in San Francisco myself I, I always maintain my midwestern roots and, and once again that authenticity mattered so <clears throat> I, I built trust faster than anyone else because I was just Jeff from the Midwest and I embraced it I didn't hide from it I embraced it yeah yeah well you can't take the Midwest out of the boy I'm mean, from the Midwest as well so right uh one book every salesperson should read. What is it? So here's – let me – this is going to be a long answer. <laughs> I have – We have a limit I, to the length of the show, but go ahead. You're right. <laughs> so I, I drive um, – I probably have I don't know, 20 hours of windshield time every week. I crush podcasts and audiobooks like a maniac. So I have – so many books. Like one of the things I actually do is offer podcast recommendations and book recommendations because I'm I devour audiobooks and I devour podcasts on a consistent basis. And I'm, I'm sure my podcast and my books are at the top of your list. You better believe it. There, you, you 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 better darn straight they are. So, to the extent that I could recommend one book, I mean, I I really have to. We mentioned the title already, but it's been very effective in this new world of of sales leaders must transform into thought leaders. Mm-hmm. And you have the ability to express yourself with video and audio platforms. Don't worry about blogging. The hell with blogging. Don't worry about writing. The marketing team doesn't want you to write. But guess what? You can flip your iPhone, hit that record button, and roll. Build your own YouTube channel and express yourself. And so Content Inc. is is a book by Joe Polizzi that will really help you understand how to craft your message. So the big question I get is, well, what do I say? Look, just talk about industry insights, but give your point of view on the industry insights. So I think Content Inc. is a really effective book because it does provide a perspective of how a sales leader can thrive in this new information-soaked world we live in. Okay, great recommendation. Here's a really tough question for you is uh, what music's on your playlist right now? Oh, here's another good one. Can I – I'll, I'll – so I have a very eclectic mix, mm-hmm. but in the office, for, I'm 45, working with a bunch of 20-somethings. I'm jamming Bieber recently, <laughs> and Beyonce, but then I love Coldplay, and, and the, my, you know what my number one motivational song is? Pearl Jam and Neil Young. So there's a YouTube video when Pearl Jam, like 2012, 2011, when you, uh, Neil Young, uh, rocking in the free world, right. playing, he comes out into the stage. And that place just shudders. It's it's like electric, and and that's um, that one I I listen to over and over again because all right uh, YouTube video Pearl Jam backing Neil Young rocking in the free world. Yeah, he oh. he comes out mid song and he surprises them and the entire oh I'm they were playing it so he yeah, came yeah, out. Oh, Pearl yeah. Jam was playing Got rocking it. in the free world and they have a long relationship, but. Um, but yeah, Neil Young kind of pops out in the middle of the song, strapped up, ready to roll. Now, I'm sure there was a degree of planning, but it looked like Eddie Vedder was surprised. But the audience was was blown away. And, the, and 
why those guys jammed. And Neil Young isn't a, you know, a spotlight, limelight guy. He just loves his art, loves his craft, and he jams. And you have to have respect for that. And the, and the fact that he's authentic, he's who he is. And, and it was just an electric moment. Wish I was there in person. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Well, good. Well, Jeff, thanks for joining me today. My guest has been Jeff Herman from Fathom. Jeff, how can people find out more about uh, Fathom or about you? So uh, you can definitely, um, I also have a podcast. It's called Publish or Perish, Selling in the Age of Content Marketing. And you can find that on iTunes or visit my personal blog. It's publishorperish.fm, as in Frank Mary. Ah, it sounds very uh, academic. Publish or perish. Not going to get yeah. tenure unless you're, but actually for salespeople, if you want to be a tenured sales rep, that's a good imperative is learn, yeah. how, to, learn how to publish content. Express yourself. It's Express yourself. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, we talk about how do you stand out from the world and, you know, with all the massive other salespeople. Right. As you said, express yourself. Right. Right. All right. Well, good. Jeff, thanks for being on the show. Really enjoyed our talk today. I, I really got a lot out of it, so thanks for having me. As did we. And uh, so remember, audience and friends, please make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And an easy way to do that is to make this podcast, Accelerate, part of your daily routine, whether you listen on your commute, in the gym, or in part of your morning sales meeting. That way you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Jeff Herman who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.